be getting to that here shortly. Uh, we always start out the show with uh, announcements of Atheist Community of Austin. We meet every Sunday down at the Hot Jumble Bakery, which is down at uh, West 5th and Lavaca. And uh, on the first Sunday of every month, we have a lecture series. And I want to clarify, I, I said Steven Weinberg, I had his name correct, but I said Nobel Peace Prize winner. He actually a Nobel Prize winner, 1979. Uh, he's a professor at University of Texas, and he's authored two books, The First Three Minutes and Dreams of a Final Theory. Uh, he will be here s September 5th for our lecture series. We're still trying to uh, talk him to come on to the show. I'd really love to have him on the show. But uh, at, that point, at this point, it's still up in the air. Uh, and I'm thinking that's all the announcements I got for Atheist Community of Austin. Uh, I Shall guess we we'll go to Jeff D. and Shall see some news? of the news that's going on. I want to start with something from today's statesman in their uh, letters section. <clears throat> There's a letter here titled, Honesty on Both Sides. It is utterly amazing to me that the age-old controversy between evolution and creationism has arisen once more. The solution simply requires a little intellectual honesty on both sides. All that is necessary is that the evolutionists admit that evolution is still a theory, and the creationists must admit that the all-powerful creator may have created the evolutionary pattern. This just highlights the implicit bias in our society. What this person is asking is that scientists admit that they could be completely wrong, and creationists admit that they could only be a little bit wrong. They, they, it, if we're going to have intellectual honesty, let's be intellectually honest about this claim of God. There is, in fact, no evidence of the existence of such a God. It's, it's all just rhetoric. And uh, when we have an admission from the creationists that their God might not exist, then we'll have intellectual honesty on both sides. What's the problem? Okay. Um, uh, it, the scientists already understand that any scientific uh, uh, conclusion could be overturned by, in, by information that comes to light in the future. They already know that, but that's no reason not to go with a well-tested theory that is held up under, you know, uh, as, as new evidence came to light and all fit in with the, exist, with the existing theory, that there's no reason not to teach that or to pretend like it's less reliable than it is. Uh, so anyway, on to the news. World still still here. <laughs> Despite various predictions based on the interp uh, on interpretations of Nostradamus, the last full eclipse of the century, the flyby of the NASA Cassini probe, and the arrival of Comet Lee, the world did not la end last Wednesday, nor, as pre uh, reported last week, did it end the previous Wednesday. Doomsayers are already predicting that the world will be ending again on January 1, 2000, May 5, 2000, etc., etc., etc. Micah White, who is a high school student from Grand Blanc, Michigan, uh, who was, uh, I think, mentioned on this show last year when he started an atheist club at his high school and had to fight with his school board to have the right to have an atheist club, even though there were religiously based clubs at his school already, uh, appeared on Politically Incorrect last night. Also on the show was a kid from California. I'm afraid I didn't jot down his name. I should have. That was bad of me. Uh, he got, was in the news recently when uh, he was barred from proselytizing during his valedictorian speech at his school. What interest me, interested me about the show was that Micah's atheism and his own struggle with his school board was never mentioned. He was identified only as uh, uh, being involved with a uh, uh, free thought group that he has founded, uh, which, of course, doesn't bring up the word atheism and, and has nothing to do with his initial struggle with his school board, which is how he got notoriety in the first place. Uh, the other kid had his struggle mentioned and was given an opportunity to discuss it. Micah's was left completely unmentioned. Uh, in fact, the word atheist never was mentioned during the entire show. At least the host did uh, uh, talk about you know, the rights of people that don't believe in God, but that's the way he put it. The A word was brushed under the carpet. Uh, uh, Micah did get applause from the audience when, uh, after the other kid described his... Uh, 
his run-in with his school board who said he could not preach to the audience that they should all become Christians during his valedictorian speech, Micah said, and they were, they were exactly correct. Uh, he got applause from the audience on the show for that. So that was a little something. Um, Micah's uh, high school group has a web page. Uh, uh, David Bagley brought this in for us. This is a printout of that page. The uh, URL is http colon slash slash atheistclub.cjb.net for those of you who want to check that out. And from there you can find a link to his new uh, overarching free thought group for uh, atheist high school kids. Um, bunches of, of relevant stuff in the press recently. I recently received the new Scientific American with a story, What Scientists Think About God. Oh, you won't be able to read that. It says, What Scientists Think About God. This is uh, an article by the fellows that uh, did that, that uh, survey recently that's been in the news um, comparing the religious beliefs of science, scientists nowadays with uh, the religious beliefs of scientists in the 1930s and finding that... Uh, in general, there is no difference. Scientists are, are no more religious now than they were in the 30s, but top scientists are more atheistic than they were in the 1930s. Uh, that's an interesting article, and they, they, uh, they are careful to make sure that, uh, they've, that they've taken into account factors such as, well, are the, the pressures that are applied to select the top scientists things that weed out uh, people who have religious beliefs because of some pre-existing bias, they go into that. Um, Time Magazine has a big issue, How Man Evolved, and uh, it's, uh, it, it's not looking good for creationists. Um, no, what I liked about this article, they were making predictions years ago, and they're now finding these predictions are true. Yeah, I haven't read it yet. Do you want to take a moment and talk about what was actually in the article? Uh, I, I didn't get this myself. Uh, they they were talking about uh, they uh, found through uh, DNA and everything else that uh, uh, there were several species of humans early on, and uh, we were the lucky bunch that survived all this. And, and I never really thought about it, but it makes sense when you think about all all the species out there that uh, there are a bunch of different apes, there's a bunch of different monkeys, and everything else. Why are is there only one human race? And it turns out there. Uh, there wasn't. There were several that had come up and died, and so you, these could be called a missing link. Uh, if, if, if you want to think of it, though, the problem is it's not one continual chain, one right after the other. It's more of a bush. So this is like a branch that went off to the side that never made it. And, uh, but these were predictions that they made years ago, you know, like 10 or 20 years ago, and they're now finding the ep fossil evidence to support that. And, uh, that was a that was a prediction based on what evolutionary theory implies. Exactly that we should have found that kind of thing, and they they've looked and they found it, and that's one of the ways in which, uh, in which you know, you know evolution is not just a theory in the traditional you know sense that people mean theory in in general speech. Um, the if you could do the same thing with the Bible, then the Bible would be more than just a theory. You know, if you could, if if uh, if you could say, well, God is described as having these characteristics, therefore we would expect to find this kind of thing in nature. Uh, then there might be some evidence that the theory of God was correct. In fact, we don't find that. We find that this supposedly omnibenevolent God, if he existed, you got it. Doesn't make sense that an omnibenevolent God would have come up with a natural system where. Get creatures horribly kill and eat each other in order to exist. Candy. I don't that, know what he was trying to do there. That was odd. And, uh, <laughs> just remind you, we are coming at you live August twenty second. We'll be taking get, phone calls. We're here, having sorry. we're having high turnover in the sound room. Uh, uh, but uh, you so have more you have to news? excuse Vic. That's okay. he's new there. Um, in the statesman, also there's the lots and lots and stuff, lots of stuff on religion. Christian America is the title of this big article, and uh, mostly, I my my opinion is it's uh, a lot of cheerleading for religion. But there is this interesting bit at the end. Um, they're uh, talking to Bruce uh, Holif, uh, excuse me, Bruce Holyfield. 
professor of American church history at Emory University's Chandler School of Theology. He says, My guess is that about 20% of Americans are diligently practicing Christians uh, uh, from the 17th century to the present. Um, and that's not the quote that I wanted to read. Um, just a moment. Oh, here we go. On paper, a far larger percentage of Americans are church members today than in the earliest days when barely one in ten Americans were likely to belong to, a con to congregations. The main reason for that is not an increase in religious commitment, but a slackening of membership standards, said Bruce Holyfield, a professor of American church history, etc. At the time of the Revolutionary War, church membership involved lengthy training and questioning, and a willingness to subject oneself to the discipline of the congregation, he said. Many more people attended church than joined. Uh, also, um, there's another comment here. Uh, uh, the May, uh, a May Gallup poll shows that 62% uh, of those questioned said religion as a whole is losing its influence on American life compared with 32% who said that they felt it was increasing. At no time since 1957 has a Gallup poll shown that a majority of Americans believed religion is gaining influence. Um, and there was one more thing that I wanted to find. Maybe I'll dig it up and read it later. Uh, that's, uh, well, that's mind, what we got in the news. We are live August 27th. Uh, I see a couple colors. Do you mind, Mark? Uh, let, let's, no. see what, let's see what they have to say here. Uh, Jimmy? Hi, how you guys doing? Fantastic. One of my favorite shows. Thank, Thank you. you. Very entertaining and very educational. We try. But I want to go ahead and add to that. Okay. Now, I noticed a lot of you guys concentrate on Christianity and the Bible. True. And you've got a good, I think, a good reason to uh, belittle it or, you know, say this is, this is you know, not really the way it is. Right. Because it's true. The Bible has been messed with, uh, particularly in the uh, latter part of the 300s and the early part of the 400s. I think he needs to undergo... Hello? Uh, our sound guy, uh, is n n oh, okay. our normal sound guy is gone, so we have a replacement, and, he, and he's learning the ropes as okay. we go. Well, bottom line is the Bible, the, the Bible has been uh, edited uh, throughout the centuries, and it's basically not really... Uh, where it's at. Exactly. Uh, I agree. However, I agree with you on that. However, if you go and look to the East and look to the uh, Hindu scriptures, particularly the Vedas, the Gita, the Upanishads, that has not been messed with. And if you go ahead and study that, I don't know if any of you guys have ever studied Hindu books or anything like that. Very little. Um, well, maybe you should start. Because you're going to say, wow, you've got access to the other 90%. Most folks over here in this country and around the world only live in a 10% region of their brain. Oh, okay. Which is the way it, most people, are definitely in this country, especially those Bible thumpers. Yeah. But you're going to go ahead, if you start reading the Gita uh, or any of these Hindu scriptures, you're going to find out, hey, you know what? This is the real deal. Uh, this is the real deal. Yeah, I think you'll find that if we lived in a Hindu nation and we had Hindu fundamentalists trying to get their claws into our government, uh, this show would be concentrating mostly on the nonsense from the Hindu religion. Uh, I also want to just mention that the uh, that that using only 10% of your brain thing is an urban myth. That is, in fact, not true. Um, the what What is actually going on is... Only you, you only have electrical activity in about 10% of your brain at a time, but that electrical act activity ranges all over the brain and uses all of it. Um, the reason why your whole brain isn't firing at once is that you're concentrating on one thing at a time. You're doing one thing at a time generally. You know when you're you don't need to have your memory of your vacation last spring to get to, to have those neurons firing off when you're doing advanced calculus. So, I hear you. I so, hear you because uh, so let's not so let's not take this urban myth and give it too much weight and then start leaping leaping from there to you know there's 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 validity to Hindu scriptures. Um, you know, the, it, if, there, if, the, if there is validity Hindu scriptures, we'll find that out 
by seeing that there are ac- that there is accurate information in it. And just because the Bible, I mean, the, yeah, it's true the Bible's been messed with, and that's an issue only because the Christians claim, the, the fundamentalist Christians claim that because it hasn't been messed with, it's still perfectly the word of God. Well, okay, fine. But if you can have, have some other group that is not, that, that for whom whether it was messed with or not is not even an issue, that still doesn't automatically make it valid. Cool. Okay. I hear you. So I have a bunch of other callers. Okay, buddy. You have Take a great care. week. <clears throat> Let's try one more. Rick? Rick? Rich. 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 I'm sorry. Okay. I, I, I tried to call last week, but I, unfortunately I got aggravated toward the end of the show and didn't manage. Sorry about that. Uh, I didn't get aggravated at you, the okay. caller. Uh, what? It has to do with the difference between a law and a theory. Okay. This, this is often confused, especially amongst creationists, and they they often advance this as an argument. True. My point is that evolution and gravity, for example, they they they're both at the same level. I agree. We call it the law of gravity, but law in physics is often misinterpreted by people. It's just a generalizing principle. Newton discovered the principle and, def- and managed to work it out mathematically, how it works, but he didn't tell us, and we still don't know exactly what it is. So the I- it, there's nothing illogical about there being a law of gravity and a theory of gravity. There are two things. They're, they mutually complement each other. The law simply explains the force mathematically, how it works. Right. The theory seeks to explain what it is, what is going on between two masses that make them attract. And the same applies to evolution. We don't call it the law of evolution. It's a principle. That's it's, it's been it's proven well over established and over again. as gravity. But there's also a theory which seeks to explain how it, well, what's the driving force? Is it primarily natural selection? Or how does speciation occur? There's plenty of wiggle room for explaining how it worked, but the fact that it occurred is beyond dispute. There's so many independent lines of evidence that point to it. It's a principle. Yeah, I appreciate your input. Okay. Have Thanks. a great week. Thanks for calling, Rich. Uh, That's a good segue. To yeah, to uh, Mark here. Mark is a former physics teacher, and uh, yes, maybe you would like to explain uh, exactly when science says theory what they mean. Well, I don't see a, a real clear-cut difference between a theory and a law. Uh, the, question, the real question is, does whatever uh, scientific procedure that you are using, is it successful in making predictions? And I suppose the more successful the theory is in making predictions, the more we tend to call it a law rather than a theory. Um, and I, I do have, it did happen to bring Newton's uh, principal work here, the print Principia, and uh, he, uh, it's probably the uh, most important book that has ever been written regarding uh, increasing the ability of humans to make successful predictions and understand things. Understanding in uh, a scientific uh, sense simply being equated with the ability to make successful predictions. Uh, that's, that's fantastic. And uh, uh, I hope you guys don't indulge me for a moment here. I think it would be a great time for me to play my tape. I'd love to play this <laughs> tape, man. If you don't, uh, this is a little project I've been working on. And, uh, and we'll get back to Mark. I promise you, Mark. And, uh, uh, this Cadillac Voodoo Choir, they released a new CD. It's coming out this week. It's called A Night with Cadillac Voodoo Choir. And, and uh, they're in the process of getting the tape together right now. But... What now? It, uh, but the, the song is called Red Dress, and I did uh, some of the camera work on this, and uh, there'll be a video called A Week with Cadillac Voodoo Choir that I'll have all 13 songs of the live CD on the, on the video and everything else. And this is going to be, we're handing this in to Austin Music Network, and hopefully you'll be seeing this, but I, I want to show you that it was me on there, and I did it first, so we get to show it on this show first. Let's go for it, guys.
Yep. Uh, we're still working on that. Sorry. Uh, uh, what, what was the problem there, guys? Okay. It, it, uh, we're coming back. To it, uh, uh, like I said, th this little side project I've been working on, uh, and we have John Coons on the line. Uh, shoot. Uh, let, let's go with John Coons. Okay. John, I'll have to wait. We have no sound. No, it, it takes a second here before the sound kick in. It'll start right now. Welcome to my God and world's day. Look here for which your rich red sound down. All right. Where your movies got to be around day. I'm not that that time.
Thanks a lot for bearing with me. It, uh, I really love that song. I thought, it, like I say, it's been released as a single. It's called Red Dress. It's Cadillac Voodoo Choir. Uh, and I, what can I say? I love this song, man. And even though, just because, not just because I had anything to do with the video or anything else. But so did you do the filming and editing? Of no, that, someone, uh, uh, the guy I'm going, uh, the project with it actually did most of the editing. I, uh -huh. I, I did you do the the the, 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 the camera work. The camera work. Yes. Right. And, uh, cool. So, that was and, uh, so yeah. So if you get a chance to go see Cadillac like Voodoo Choir, definitely get a get out there and see them. Uh, and like I say, uh, that'll be released on the radio. So you'll be hearing it on the radio here, hopefully this week, and Austin Music Network and everything else. That's so right. I do appreciate you bearing with me, and I appreciate Mark for bearing with us too. We have John Coons on the line, so can we go to John Coons? John. Hey, Ray. How's it going? All right. How you doing? Did you like the song? Yeah. Yeah. It's great. Thank you. It's good to, to see some uh, atheist talent on the uh, show as well as the other things we do. Uh, that's what I thought. Thank you. I was watching the tape that we you made from last week's show yes. the other day, and I just wish I'd seen it live so I could call in last week to say a few things. <laughs> uh, one well, thing I would add to yes? the discussion about what a theory is, Right. Uh, theories also do three things. First of all, they're supported by lots of lines of evidence, like has already been pointed out. But they also make predictions. And also, they lead to new discoveries. Right, exactly. Which is why when the creationists try to get their nonsense in the school as some kind of theory, it doesn't do any of those things. It doesn't make predictions, and it certainly doesn't need lead to new discoveries being made about the universe. Yeah. So, and to my mind, I like what the earlier caller said about a law and a theory. Uh where he was talking about uh, Newton's laws of gravity. Right. I, to me, they're kind of the same thing. Uh, basically, if you look at the history of what a law means, people like Newton were, uh, they were religious. They were not atheists, and many of them. And they were trying to discover the laws of the universe that they thought their God had made up to set up the universe. And in their thinking, if they could discover the laws of the universe, then they could basically know everything there is to know. And so, to them, that's kind of what a law meant. Whereas now we probably call that a theory. And also point out that Einstein's theories of relativity do a better job, more accurate job of, uh, you know, uh, describing uh, certain things than Newton's laws of gravity. So, it's not like there's a hierarchy there where you get to be a law after yeah. And what I love about uh, a lot of theories that Einstein put out, he put them out uh, 50 years ago, and a lot of them weren't proved until after he was dead. That's right. And uh, that that shows you what a theory can do. It, it makes predictions, and if it if it doesn't fit uh, the results, then we go back and re-examine that theory and try. Right. You know, it it's a um, it's an evolving process. Right. It, compared um, compared to religion, where. Uh, you know, if if you if you believe that God will answer your prayers, and you pray and nothing happens, the response in religion is to say, well, you know, uh, you know, you're you're tempting God to prove that He exists, and you're not supposed to do that, or you, God's plan is mysterious, or you know, all these excuses to explain why your prediction, based on what you thought, what your theory of God is, didn't bear out. Yeah, and if if well, if you were in science and you had a theory of of God and you made predictions based on the theory and they weren't borne out, you'd throw out the theory. That's right. Yeah, that's right. I, a couple other quick things to sure. say. If you got a second. Sure. You, you were talking about Michael White. Yeah. Uh, he's in a it's YFA Youth Free Thought. A I can't remember what the A stands for. Alliance, but, I think. Yeah, it might be. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of kids out there that are in this, and there's an email circle, and there's a couple of us who are teachers that are on it too. Oh, really? If you're, if anybody's out there listening is interested, yeah, get in touch with the Council for Secular Humanism, and you can get to the links from there. But there is, you know, there is something out there for kids who are junior high, high school, and, and college to be involved in some kind of free thought thing. And along those lines, I got my free thought club first meeting planned for this last week at school. Nobody showed up, but we got it over the announcement, so the kids know that there is, it is okay to be an atheist. Yeah. It is not something that you're going to be in trouble for. Keep trying, John. We, we, we applaud we, your efforts. Which is what some of them actually think. Yeah, That's fantastic. And then the last thing I'd say is this. Uh, there's something real exciting going on right now that came off the Atheist Alliance uh, 
news, news thing. Right. Uh, there's a guy, Herb Silverman. He's the guy who was uh, fighting to be a notary public in South Carolina. Oh, had, yeah. Right. I think it went all the way. But it requires a, a, a God oath, right? Yeah. Uh, he, he won. But anyway, oh. this guy is trying to put together a meaningful coalition between all the atheist groups and humanist groups out there. Oh, is that the same guy? I got your email well, about that. Yeah, that's the guy. That'd and be he, fantastic. And what, and what this guy is doing, which I think is a really cool tactic, because you know there's a lot of resistance among some of the different organizations, too. Right. You know. But what this guy is doing, which I think is cool, is he's joining all of them. Mm-hmm. And he, with the idea that, you know, if enough people did that, we could sway this kind of thing to where we actually had a meaningful coalition where these different groups would sit down and cooperate and we could become, you know, we, ha- we would have the, the power we deserve, you know, based on our numbers. We and, 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 let, and let the politicians and, court our vote. Right. Exactly. And it's when, when, when the Christians put aside their differences enough to become the Christian coalition and these other groups that they became politically powerful. And there's nothing stopping us from doing that. We, we have an opportunity and we should... You know, probably take advantage of it. Anyway, I'm gonna I'm gonna send that to the bagel shop today. I probably won't be there, but uh, for at first anyway. But I'll have that sent down there, so maybe you guys can look at it. Fantastic. So, well, keep up the good work, guys. You have a great week. Hey, you know, no no creationists are gonna call in now. You know, uh, you got a science teacher on the show. They won't call in. <laughs> we'll you know. see. We'll see. All right, take you it got easy. the point though. All right, take care. Uh, let's try another call here. Uh, Paul. Um. Yeah. Hi there. Um. I was just kind of curious. Um. What your opinion was on uh, that Kansas Board of Education decision, and uh, how other states are thinking about adopting a similar thing, you know, where they're going to well, eliminate uh, uh, evolution. I'll, I'll, I'll allow our guest to comment on that. And, uh, well, I, I haven't really been keeping up with the uh, news coming out of Kansas. Uh, my general impression, from what I have heard, is that it's a very poor decision that the uh, was it the state board of education yeah, that uh, correct. made this decision. That's it. Uh, what I understand, they're saying uh, it's no longer required to be taught in, so they're not, they're not going to put it on the state finals test. So they're not going to test the kids on evolution. So if they're not going to test it, the teachers aren't going to teach it. And, uh, so, uh, kind of but they're leaving it the up dark, to each uh, individual schools, from what I understand. Kind of going back to the dark ages and all that stuff. That's amazing, isn't it? Yeah. Um, hey, I was wondering if I could, uh, if you guys wouldn't mind if, to plug me. Uh, I'm having a Emergency yard sale up at 51st and Duval. Uncle Paul's emergency punk rock yard sale. Got to get to Oklahoma. Family needs me. I don't know if we're allowed to do that or not, but uh, lots of luck on your garage sale, guy. All right, thanks, man. You take care. <laughs> uh, that's the first time anybody asked to do that, huh? Uh, but uh, I, 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 I do want to get Mark uh, opinions here and stuff. You were talking about uh, how our um, our school system ranks towards the other nations. And, yeah. Actually, uh, many viewers uh, may know that the Austin Independent School District recently hired a new superintendent. His name is Pascal, or Pat Forgione, and uh, recently he was at the U.S. Department of Education, and he was the commissioner of the largest international science and mathematics study that's ever been commissioned. And uh, over the past uh, couple of years, the U.S. Department of Education put out some reports on the achievement of U.S. kids versus kids from many other countries in science and mathematics. I've got the uh, reports here from the fourth grade level, from the eighth grade level, and from the twelfth grade level. And as you might uh, or might not uh, be aware, the results uh, for the United States are pretty poor. Uh, I can read just a little bit from uh, Commissioner Forgione's statement here. Uh, He says, the third international mathematics and science study, TIMS is what they call it, is the largest, most comprehensive, and most rigorous international study of schools and student achievement ever conducted. Now, according to the uh, results here, I pulled out a couple of the uh, more alarming results. Uh, There are a lot of alarming results in them. But according to the 12th grade TIMS report, that's this one here, and we're talking high school seniors. Yep. Yeah. Uh, the U.S. placed dead last out of the 16 nations listed under average physics performance of advanced science students in all countries, and 15th out of 16 nations uh, listed under advanced mathematics performance of advanced mathematics students in all countries. Now, they tried to get a, a sample 
that represented about the top oh, 10 to 20 percent of uh, math and science students in the participating countries. But what's uh, slightly more alarming about the 12th grade report is that the 12th grade report didn't even include Singapore, Korea, or Japan, which were by far the highest achieving countries at the 4th and 8th grade level. And uh, although it, we don't have the statistics for them at the 12th grade level, because they didn't participate, uh, I would well imagine that they would perhaps be at the uh, top at the 12th, 12th grade level too, and it would uh, further emphasize the poor achievement in U.S. Uh, elementary and secondary schools in science and mathematics. Uh, I happened to bring by, I was trying to think of uh, a couple of things that uh, we do differently here than in the high achieving countries. What I have here are examples of Korean science and mathematics books for the sixth grade, these are for the seventh grade, and these are for the eighth grade. And one thing that you notice about these science and math books that the Koreans uh, provide is that they're very lightweight, they're very small, uh, they are paperback, they're thin. Uh, the difference here is that in the high achieving countries, it seems that unlike in the United States, their kids keep their books at the end of each year, whereas in the United States generally, kids are expected to return their books at the end of each year. So um, in those countries, kids develop a, a home library of familiar books over several years, and their teachers can expect that if uh, the kid needs to review some material, they can do so at home, and so the teachers probably don't cover as much uh, review material uh, in the current year, which is one of the problems that uh, the, the science study and mathematics study indicated about U.S. instructional methods, that teachers tend to, in this country, tend to cover a lot of review material and cover the same topics year after year. And I suspect that if, uh, if we could uh, find a way to provide yeah, that's Kids. a wonderful idea. I didn't know they did that. that that's a fantastic idea. Uh, well, the other thing I understand, uh, they go to school uh, longer during the year than uh, American kids. Isn't uh, that true? According to the study, I'd have to review it again. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't find a big difference there. They did, the study did indicate the number, that the number of hours that U.S. children spend in math and science classes is more than what... Uh, Japanese and German kids spend in science that. and math. I math didn't classes. know that, no. Right. And, uh, so it sounds like a difference in the way they're spending their time while they're there rather than just number of hours. Yeah. I, I was thinking uh, the long gap is the reason they had to keep doing review every, every year when the school starts. They're reviewing what they did last year because they're off for three months or whatever. And I, I, my, my understanding is that's, uh, that's an American tradition that they take the three months off during the summer. I, I thought... Other school, uh, other nations were teaching these kids all year long. Yeah, I, I don't know the details about the the uh, uh, the breaks that the other countries have. But one thing that the study reports is that in a particular year, in Japan, uh, in their math classes, they may focus on five to ten major subjects during the year, and right. they go into they, they focus deeply on those and make sure kids learn those things so that they don't have to cover it again the next year. Whereas uh, in the United States, uh, uh, we tend to cover perhaps 25 or 30 topics a year, and consequently teachers have trouble uh, getting through all that material. Plus, our textbooks have to contain a lot of review material since kids can't be expected to have uh, their review material from previous years at home. And so teachers tend to... And uh, the textbooks are uh, developed by committee, so they're, uh, in my opinion, they're really watered down because uh, they, uh, they don't want to make it too hard or uh, they don't want to make uh, offend anyone. They want to make sure uh, that they can, the kids can understand. What, and by doing that, they actually dumbing the books down, oh. is what I feel. That's my opinion. 
publishers, I'm sure, have an incentive to uh, make our textbooks all things to all school districts. Well, if you don't mind, we'll, we'll get back to the phone. I, I see Joe Zemecki. He, he's our former co-host. Uh, Joe? Well, good morning. Uh, how you doing? Hi, Joe. Okay. It's great to hear from a bunch of atheists on TV. And, and, and Mark doing a great job? Oh, he's yeah, a, yeah. Mark's a new member. I don't think you got a chance to meet Mark before you left. No. And, uh, I've only been listening for a couple of minutes, though. and uh, So, anyway. Great. Um, I just had a couple short things. Sure. Because of Kansas, I wanted to ring, bring this up. Uh, this is a little bit of good news from Kansas. This comes from okay. Reuters a couple months ago. In Manhattan, Kansas, officials have removed an oversized tablet engraved with the Ten Commandments, backing away from a legal battle with civil liberties groups. The five-foot-high granite tablet has stood outside City Hall in Manhattan, Kansas, for more than 40 years. But its display on public property has challenged or was challenged in court by the ACLU. So that's down and gone, probably for good. Then I had a joke. Good news. Got a little joke here. <laughs> okay. We can use some humor. What's that? We can use some humor. Yes, yes, yes. Three boys are in a schoolyard bragging about their fathers. The first boy says, My dad scribbles a few words on a piece of paper. He calls it a poem, and they give him $50. The second boy says, That's nothing. My dad scribbles a few words on a piece of paper. He calls it a song, and they give him $100. The third boy says, I got you both beat. My dad scribbles a few words on a piece of paper. He calls it a sermon, and it takes eight people to collect all the money. <laughs> I like. Thank you, Joe. I like that. Yes. Excellent. Yes. Okay. Well, hey, uh, I'll let to listen for a few more minutes off the air, then. Sure. I'll put you on hold. Thanks a lot. You have a great week. All righty. All right. Let's go to uh, Lisa. Hi. Good morning. Good morning. Good, good morning. Uh, do you have a question? I look so ugly. We do? Uh, okay. Thanks for your call. Let's go on down to RC. RC? Hey, good morning, guys. All right. You going to tell me I'm ugly, too? <laughs> well, I was just going to tell you that uh, you guys all look uh, diverse. I'll put it that way. <laughs> we, uh, the atheist community in Boston is a very diverse group. Yes, it is. I, I think I, I really thank the Lord for your program because it pretty much. Uh, uh, it, I, it, uh, I don't think he has anything to do with the show, but uh, <laughs> feel free to do it. Anyway, I guess. here's my question. Sure. Uh, did I know she didn't um, have anything to say about the article, the little small article in section uh, A about Carl Sagan uh, this morning? Yeah, I hadn't had a chance to read today's paper. What did it say? Just didn't get it, around to it. it. Well, it just talked about his uh, marijuana use. Marijuana use, and I guess my question was, is this: um, Y'all seem to think a lot of Carl Sagan. Yes, we do. Um, what do you think about his, you know, his his attitude towards the the laws that were in place at that time? And would you recommend uh, pot use, you know, I guess to yourselves or to no, and, uh, atheists? There's, no. there's there's hardly a bigger fan of Carl Sagan than me. I've never used drugs, never had any interest, uh, and this is news to me. So uh, uh, yeah, I'm a little I'm a little uh, uh, unbalanced by this. Um, <clears throat> I would uh, at the moment my my reaction is well, I never saw him come up out in public and say anything about this. Uh, he kept it a private affair, and. Uh, and did not become a, a big pro pro drug advocate. Had he done that, that would have formed part of my reaction to him, and uh, I might or might not have felt differently about him. One small article doesn't really fill me in on all I would want to know about that. But you'd still say he's a good role model. Uh, I I have no problem with that. Well, you know, if if we're gonna if we're gonna say that uh, that George Bush Jr. is a good role model in spite of his uh, his drug use, alleged drug uh, like use. A, alleged drug use, then uh, yeah, no, I don't think that immediately has a major impact. I mean, yeah. I look at what he did say in public mm -hmm. and whether that made any sense, and that's how I form my opinion of him. Yeah, well, the problem I see is that a person in Carl Sagan's position or in the three of y'all's position up there is that when you have a law and you basically don't agree with it, uh, a Christian would say, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to obey the authorities uh, who've been placed over me by God, and I'm going to obey the law unless it 
uh, contradicts God's law. But uh, an atheist would probably say, well, I just... I don't agree with uh, the law against marijuana, so I'm going to smoke it anyway. Yeah. And, um, well, I'm, you okay. run into so, you run into problems when you try to put all atheists into one group. Sure. We're such a diverse group. Sure. Uh, so uh, uh, whether you, or not do, uh, do, you, do you have a mission statement? The, the, no, I want to. I would do want to sure. respond to that sure, last comment. Um, uh, yeah, there definitely are a lot of say libertarians in, among atheists and and people who think that drugs should be legalized. Right. I don't happen to be one. Uh, it's not that I have a really major thing against drugs. It's just not an issue for me. It's like, uh, you know, I recognize that, that no matter what our laws are, there are going to be some things that some people want to do that society is going to decide that, that, that it's going to be illegal. Okay. Um, so, uh, yeah, you know, my reaction to laws like that is what you just described as, as the so-called Christian position. Right. You know, and in my opinion, the thing to do when a thing is illegal is refrain from that, and if you think that it's a bad law, work to get it changed, sure. and then go ahead and do it if it gets changed. Sure. That, I mean, that is my opinion. So, so I would disagree with you that there is some hard line between the way Christians would react to laws they don't like and the way atheists in, in general react to laws they don't like. Well, you may need to start looking for a new ro role model. No, I... I... As, as, as long as... As long as, you know, there are no books published by Carl Sagan where he makes a big deal about, um, you know, about things that I don't agree with, and there aren't, uh, what he did in his private life is, uh, is something I'm going to have to confront, and I'll, mm -hmm. I'll let you know what I, what I decide about that. Um, but in the meanwhile, yeah, I mean, there, there is no indication that, that, uh, that, that he was a bad person here. Uh. I still, he may have done something that I personally disagree with. Because his scientific theories that he uh, published, uh, the marijuana use has no bearing on those. They're, they're true because they're true. They're not true because he got high and came up with the idea. Yeah. Uh, so it, uh, I, I, I don't understand the connection at well, all. Well, that's myself. my problem with atheism. You, you seem to try to project free thought, but you have a fixed position. Uh, uh, what, that, that? <laughs> well, you, you, you asked about a mission statement. Uh, allow me to read that real yeah. quick. Atheist Community of Austin is organized as a nonprofit educational corporation to develop and support atheist community, to provide opportunities for socializing and friendship, to promote atheist viewpoints, to encourage positive atheist culture, to defend the First Amendment principle of state church separation, and to oppose discrimination against atheists, and to work with other organizations in pursuit of common goals. Yeah, uh, that basically is our mission statement. I'll just make a statement, and I'll let you go on to the next callers. But sure. Most of that is negative. In other words, you spend very little time talking about what the what the atheist viewpoint really is, and and there's a there are three or four statements in there that talk about what you're against. And no. but I, I appreciate you guys because you're better than the you know the last team that was here ten years ago. <laughs> well. I you're right. We do have a bunch of other callers. I do appreciate okay. your, your phone call. Okay. Uh, and please call again. Okay. Yeah, that, that issue yeah. keeps coming up. I mean, there isn't a one, you know, atheist position on all kinds of stuff. Atheism is the lack of belief in any gods. All right. Period. And since we have such an active, uh, uh, you know, theist gr uh, uh, community in this country trying to impose theism on people, um, we had that that gives us the one issue we need to band together and do stuff so uh you'll find a lot of differing opinions among atheists about exactly what is right and wrong you know yeah. what, what is what is the right way for the country to be uh but the the one issue that 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 holds us together is the definition of atheism so it uh uh, we have several people in the group that are for capital punishment. We have several people in the group that are against capital punishment. We have people that are for and against abortion. And, uh, there is no one set uh, position on any political question that you have out there that you can actually say that's an atheist point of view when it comes to like capital punishment or abortion. Or Do we anything. have Carl Sagan on our t-shirts? Is he listed yeah, as an he, atheist? Yes. yes, he is. Is he? Okay. And, uh, Cause that, uh, uh, okay. Yeah. I think I just hung up on RC there, uh, Keith. And uh, so, which one's Oops. Ed? Uh, yeah. Ed? Uh, yeah. Well, I was just trying to say, like, you know, there are a lot of Christian role models out there. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, and yeah. the other thing I was going to talk about was, um, you know, a while back, 
the Christians were, uh, or yeah, the Christians were really against the uh, idea that the world was not flat and the center of the universe. And for a and long time, yeah, science that. proved that wrong. It's kind of the same thing all over again, you know. Um, I just wanted to comment on that. So, yeah, oh, I appreciate your call. Okay, you have a great week. Let's go on down to Mike. Good morning, guys. Good morning, Mike. Good morning. Well, I got a chuckle of the guy who said that uh, all Christians obey all the laws. So I guess I'm driving down the freeways and stuff, and people are exceeding the speed limits. They're all atheists. So I guess what Christians never exceed the speed limit. Yeah. I mean, the uh, guy is just ridiculous. Well, I guess they call it civil, civil disobedience when they uh, disrupt the abortion clinic or whatever else. Yeah, you know, they murder doctors and stuff. Uh, exactly. And, you know, I mean, marijuana, I've never never bought it and had no use for it, but I know a lot of people who do smoke, a lot of Christians who smoke it. Uh, and, I mean, the re only reason it's illegal now is because, uh, you know, the government can't get its tax money. I think the tobacco lobby is a little too strong. The fact that Carl Sagan may have smoked it... Um, doesn't diminish uh, what he said and what he's written, like Jeff said. I mean, exactly. he's never come out in public and publicly endorsed it. I mean, I don't like marijuana smoking just like I don't like tobacco smoking. I mean, I don't feel like you should uh, take smoke into your lungs on purpose. I mean, why not just go to smokestack and start inhaling? Uh, but again, it's I don't think there's, just because it's against the law, uh, I mean, why is it against the law, basically? Well, yeah, yeah, but... But I mean, his point was well taken. I mean, for it, yeah. the purpose of having laws is to establish, you know, what are the appropriate behaviors and what aren't. And there are always going to be problems with that. There are always going to be laws that got passed that that individuals disagree with, you know. And there's a real issue there of whether just disagreeing with the law gives you the, you know, uh, makes it sensible for you to violate that law yourself. And you know, I'm very torn about that, and that's why I, I stay out of the whole, the whole you know, uh, drug legalization issue. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's a non-issue to me. But also, I mean, look back in the 1860s with slavery. Slavery was uh, not against the law in the South, so basically if you helped uh, a slave escape, you were breaking the law. Yeah. Would you say you should not do that? Yeah. Uh, again, I, yeah. there, there are some so laws I, I, that I don't know, make sense. I know, I'm very, I'm very torn about that. Yeah. I don't know. Again, I, I'm, I, you know, I don't use the stuff, and uh, I don't really see why people do, but they're not harming anybody. If they're harming anyone, they're harming themselves. Good point. And, again, Carl was saying I don't think she'd be diminished because he smoked it if he did. My, my, biggest, my biggest personal concern about drugs is, you know, it sort of it, it concerns me whenever people artificially interfere what's going on with what's going on in their own brains. Oh, I agree with and that. And so, for me, the biggest issue would be, well, did Carl Sagan, uh, you know, take drugs and then turn around and make and say things that made no sense? And I'm a fan of Carl Sagan because he said stuff that did make sense. So, you know, um, on that basis, it's you know, it's not much of an issue either. I appreciate you call. Bye. You have a great week. Let's try one more here. Armando. Hi. How's it going, guys? Good morning. Uh, I have a comment to make first, and then a question. Uh, okay. My comment is, uh, the atheists I have known, I've always had a, uh, a certain amount of respect for. Uh, when it comes to laws and society, uh, not having a theism generally gives you reason to pause and question why you do what you do, rather than just blindly following a faith. And uh, the atheists that I've known as a result uh, are very well founded in why they obey laws and why they're living their life, and uh, I, I think they put a lot more thought than, I hate to say this, more some Christians give themselves credit for into their lives. Excellent point. Um, the other thing that I want to ask, though, is sure. um, I, I believe this way, and yet I still am a Christian because there is something that I gained from my Christianity, uh, and that is a belief in a God, not an organized religion or institutionalized religion, but a belief in a God allows me to embrace a certain idealism in humanity. Uh, this idealistic concept that, you know, maybe we could all be perfect, maybe we really could all get along, and that's something we should strive for. Uh, my question is probably an individual question for each of you, is sure. um, that's what I do gain from my faith, even though I believe in questioning things outside of a religious, you know, format when you look at society. Um, what do you gain from your atheism? I'm just out of honest curiosity. Intellectual integrity. Uh, I, like hmm. you said, uh, most of the atheists I met have been uh, higher than average intelligence. And so uh, uh, my own personal experience, when someone introduces themselves as an atheist, uh, I automatically 
uh, think that this person has taken the time and come to their worldview through thought and uh, research. They just didn't go with blind faith that somebody wrote down in a book there. Uh, but I would love to hear uh, Mark, our guest, point of view on this. Well, I, I think it's important to uh, have worldviews that allow you to more successfully predict the consequences of actions that you might take. And I, I don't see uh, any uh, indication that a belief in a God leads you to a, an ability to make more successful predictions. And, and so I personally... Well, uh, if I could offer something and tell me what you guys think. Um, I found that when you look at the world, there is what you think will happen and what you think should happen. And that if you restrict yourself to what you think will happen, that you lowball society. You, you automatically underestimate the potential of what humans can do as a group. And oh, yeah. part of the you reason why I embrace religion. Yeah, I, I like, like my turn. Because right, yeah. I consider myself an idealist. And I do that not by believing that there's some supernatural power that will enable us to all be perfect. I do that in spite of the fact that I recognize that perfection is a utterly worthless concept, that there mm. is just no such thing as perfection. But I do recognize that uh, if, if, it, if you can see that it would be nicer for things to be a different way, mm -hmm. working toward that goal is perfectly legitimate, even if you understand, like I do, that, that a, a perfect achievement of that goal will never be possible. You see, so I, 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 for me, the, the, the necessity of supernatural perfection is completely irrelevant. Well, uh, but, but on a different point, I mean, I understand that perfection is ultimately a goal we can't reach. That I, I, I can see that definitely. However, aren't goals supposed to be unattainable? I mean, to the extent that you put a goal out of reach, doesn't it give you a reason to continue to strive and progress? That, that's one way I, of looking at it. I, I consider that an irrelevant question because, you know, it's, it's, <laughs> uh, uh, there are different kinds of goals. There are, of course, short-term attainable goals, right? And then there are long-term, possibly attainable, possibly not attainable goals. And I, I don't think, you know, when you ask, aren't they supposed to be? Well, there are, there are, there are strategies in which you want to pick attainable goals. And then there are strat strategies where you don't care that they're not attainable. From in my point of view, mm -hmm. you know, and it's not it's not like all goals need to be unattainable ones. It's not like that's always better. So I do have a question for you, though. Sure. Uh, you you're saying a belief in God. I would like to hear your definition of God. Um, a lot of mainstream Christians probably aren't going to agree with me at this because I, I believe in a personal religion, not an institutionalized or organized one. Uh, uh, but when I conceive of a God, to me personally inside, He's just the ultimate Father. Uh, the the per, the perfect conception of what I think a father would be, uh, who will, on the one hand, want you to strive to be as good as you are, but on the other hand, allow you to get there to a certain degree on your own. And he's not going to necessarily tell you exactly what you need to do and show you exactly what you need to do, but set up the situation and then let you learn. I yeah. st I, st I find it hard to where that would actually help you in your day to day life. Yeah, see, from, God. from our point of view, the, you know, my, our questions would be, one, um, why do you need some outside guy to tell you to excel or want you to excel if you already want that yourself? And two, why, you know, why imagine this being who's frankly in your way and has to allow you to succeed? You know, well, why I, not, if there wasn't that guy there in the first place, whether you succeed or fail is going to be up to you, and there's no special supernatural force you have to appeal to to make it possible for you to do so. Well, uh, uh, I'll tell you what I gained from it. Um, well, uh, t t let me just slip in a comment here first, and I have to respect the fact sure. that I have uh, a much more in-depth conversation with the three of you than I have with the average Christian on subjects like this. And I, I uh, ultimately, you're fulfilling what I've always had about atheism in that you guys really think about what you believe. That's cool. Putting that aside, um, I'll tell you what I gained from this, this, this idealism, this belief in someone who may or may not be there. The definition of faith is not really knowing. I don't know if God exists, but the, my point is, is that I want to believe He exists. 
mm-hmm. the reason why I want to believe he exists is because I do gain something from it. It goes back to what I was talking about earlier. There is what you think will happen and what you think should happen. And mm-hmm. my personal faith in a God releases me to pursue what I think should happen regardless of the limitations of rationality. Because as far as rationality goes, it has a lot of really cool tools to give you a way to to cope with your world. But there are some limitations. And the limitations of rationality are the fact that, practically speaking, no, we'll never reach perfection. And unfortunately, (laughs) rationality keeps thrusting that obstacle in your way. But there is nothing at all irrational about recognizing that a, that a, a direction you know, a, a direction toward an unattainable goal can have value even if the goal itself is not achievable. There's nothing irrational about recognizing that. And, to, you know, I think you're cutting, you're, you're cutting uh, uh, rationalism short if you think that rationalism you know, says that you can't, that, that you're wasting your time if you work toward unattainable, uh, you know, ultimate goals. But it does continually thrust the obstacle in front of you it, that this is I, an impractical end. And it's wasted energy to try and achieve this impractical end. I, I don't find that. And the reason is, if there is an unattainable goal in that direction, mm-hmm. if I move an inch in that direction, I have improved. Right? And every time I move another inch in that direction, I have improved my situation, regardless of whether I ever ultimately get to the end of the goal. Well, but, you know, rationality will tell you that to the extent that you have to increase your effort in that direction, there comes a point at which it, it's no longer rational to continue in that direction. You know, sure, but, but perfect... rationality is also a wonderful way of increasing your power to go in any direction you want. Well, and, and what I hope you can appreciate is that given, uh, this is hard to say as a general generalization, but for me, faith allows me a, a profound way to continue in a given direction as well. Okay. Um, the the one other thing that I wanted to say that I do gain from from faith uh, is an idealism about a society as a family. About uh, again, it's outside of rationality. It's an emotional attachment and appreciation for a group of people that I want to be a part of. And you know, uh, and I think that's very possible to get very far with atheism. And you three, obviously, uh, I can appreciate the fact that you guys have have. Uh, really sorted out what you want in life and probably are going to go much farther than most Christians that I know in terms of getting what you need. Mark has a question for you. Caller, I'd I'd like to point out that you put your faith in predictions of science every single day in nearly everything you do. Exactly. And and therefore, uh, in a manner of speaking, I believe in a certain amount of faith period in that for my life, it's better that my faith is balanced against my rationality and vice versa. Well, the point I'm making is that if you're putting your faith in science... Mm-hmm. in nearly everything you do, uh, what more do you need to put your faith in? Why? Uh, are, uh, I mean, why not simply uh, replace your notion of a god with uh, something uh, much more concrete like nature? Well, because honestly, science has yet to appeal to humanity. And that's, I know that's a real vague term, but it has, science has gone really far, and perhaps someday it will reach certain applications where it does this. But as it stands right now, science doesn't appeal to the human relationship between each other. You know, it, it can tell us well, a lot yes about... No, it depends on what... I, I think you should look into some game theory, because there hmm. are, uh, there are uh, perfectly rational ways of looking at things that show... Uh, for instance, that uh, forgiveness in a society is a is a practical tool. You know, some of these some of these things that we consider, you know, oh, no one would ever choose to live like that. The only reason anybody lives that way is because they're told by a religion that that's the right way to live. Well, no, that turns out not to be the case. The reason that that most rules of behavior are things that are considered good is because they have practical benefit, and. You know, you don't you don't need some supernatural outside force to make that to make that be true. That just happens to be true. Ah, uh, but see, here's here's the rub: is let's say you have a group of a hundred people who aren't related to each other necessarily. You don't mm-hmm. have a reason to have faith in the person next to them. The rule is, you know, you shouldn't kill somebody. That's uh-huh. fine as long as you believe that those other ninety nine people are going to follow the same rule. Now, if you don't believe that they are, and rationality will give you a certain argument that, you know, you kind of have to watch yourself and not necessarily have faith that they're going to follow that rule, 
you end up killing people that maybe you don't necessarily have are to. They, are, are those hundred people living together in some kind of, some kind of group? Uh, it would be assumed you know, that, yeah, are they that like, they're around each other. They're around each other. See, as soon as they're around each other, they are a society. And exactly. out of that society, you will automatically get rules of behavior that are eventually shared by everybody because that's the rules. Of society. They need to evolve that group of rules in order to continue to exist. Yeah, sure, but, there will be short-term problems. You're going to get that anyway. It is not as if Christianity, with, it, with its message of love, has ever you know, interfered with there being wars happening. You know? That's true. Uh, that's so true. so uh, I don't think there's evidence that, the, that faith, a faith-based view of that necessarily uh, you know, well, guarantees any, any better results. On a practical day-to-day level, you know, I, I could sit in my little house in Austin and be paranoid about my neighbors with yeah. a shotgun on my couch and be ready to shoot anybody who walks through the door. Or I can have a certain amount of faith that people are basically good and, and live that out to its logical end where I help people who don't necessarily ask. Or where, you could or you could rationally understand that you're part of a society that like has things like law enforcement, you know, and try to uh, and you know, I just accept accept that things are not gonna always go perfectly. I can accept those things, and that's true, but that's not necessarily rational. You yeah. can pull out any statistics and see how ineffective I, I, I think it is. Forces. <laughs> you can see how what the crime is, crime rate is, you yeah. know, and, and logically deduce that you have an X percentage amount of being a victim of a crime regardless sure. of anything that happens. And what's wrong with that? Um, no, there's nothing wrong with that, but at that point... Does, that does faith make that not so? Obstacle. I mean, if there, was, if there was a 1% chance every time you step out your door, of course, that's way too high. If there was a 1% chance every time you step out your door that somebody's going to kill you, right. right? does having faith that that will not happen make it not so? No. No. But uh, what, The best thing faith... to do is to have a clear understanding of what is actually going on, accept that you, you don't get perfection ever, and move on in some useful direction trying to improve things. I... And you, don't, you need no faith for that. I, we have a bunch of other callers. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Thank you very I much. do appreciate, appreciate your time. input. Thank you have you. a great week. Bye. And, uh, good morning, Sam. Hey, how you doing, people? Fantastic. Morning, Sam. Well, I thought I a couple of comments on what you were just talking about there. Well, I mean, first place, I don't know. Uh, at least a lot of different versions of uh, you know biblical religion, Christianity, are far from uh, um, inciting to self improvement, right? I mean, they got the doctrine of original sin. Right, we say that I don't know you're inherently right. you're already inherently evil before you start because you were born uh, with sexual intercourse or something. And then there's a thing with the um, Tower of Babel, right? Right. Where like uh, I don't know, man sort of became uh, they all spoke the same language and uh, they were building a tower uh, and it was their mighty heaven. So the Lord uh, struck them down and uh, scattered their uh, all right, uh, scattered their language. And uh, and then well, in general, it seems like a lot of a lot of religious people. Well, well, that the whole idea that uh, um, if if everything is already created by this perfect, um, what can you say, omnipotent, uh, um, um, omnibenevolent deity, then any right. change you make is essentially interfering. You, you, with your sinful, limited human capacity, you're interfering with what's already supposedly perfect in some mysterious way. So it's far from uh, um, um, inciting to uh, idealism or uh, any great effort to human perfection. Right, and and matter of fact, we know today, for instance, the religious right always they definitely improve a lot of things. Like they oppose things like the idea of uh, genetic improvement in humans. Why is a thing that they consider, oh, gee, that's playing God. We wouldn't want to do that. Yeah. And uh, so, a lot of the, I know a lot of uh, sort of Christian types. They believe anything not mentioned in the Bible is wrong. Now, there's an awful lot of stuff not mentioned in there, like electric lights, planes, I don't know what all. Not to mention nuclear weapons. All right, all that stuff. Is uh, I don't know. <laughs> I'm kind of with them on nuclear weapons, though. <laughs> well, I, maybe I would be too. The whole thing is their idea is that anything that's not mentioned there has got to be wrong. Well, that's right. far from yeah, for uh, different um, reasons. Uh, you know, at least now maybe some religions all sort of uh, you know um, believe in um, you know um, infinite improvement or uh, tremendous idealism, but most of the ones around here, anyway, <laughs> far from it. They seem like they're really the opposite of it. But uh, they you know they sort of. Basically, they're against any kind of real, uh, sort of, um, you know, human improvement in any essential sense. I, I appreciate your call. We have a bunch of other callers. Mm. All right, you have a great week. Let's keep on going down to Paul. 
Hi. Um, I'd sort of like to address something that a, a caller before last raised. Sure. Um, there's this really common view that a lot of uh, religious people, especially Christians, have. Oh, it's have. Paul Wilson. Yeah. That's I me. recognize Hi. your voice. <laughs> Thanks for calling. Sure. Um, there's this really common view that a lot of these people have, which is that there's some conflict between being rational and being moral. Yeah. And I think this is partly a historical thing that, you know, traditional Christian theology has had this idea of sin and the worldly aspect of humans, and that you have to squash that to make people moral by having them follow this highfalutin religious idealism. And part of it is because people have been watching Star Trek too much, and they have this idea that there's the Kirk type and the Spock type, and Spock is really rational, and Kirk doesn't have to be irrational because he's a mensch. He has, like, you know, he has good intuition, and he'll just go kick alien butt if he needs to, and he'll get the babes too. And of course, most people would rather be Kirk than Spock because they'd rather get the babes or whatever. Um, but this is all very bogus. Because the idea that there's a conflict between morality and rationality is ludicrous. And it presupposes an idea that is very popular, that the only rational thing is to be selfish, which is false. And right. it, it's given that we are social organisms, we're evolved to live in societies. We've been living in societies for millions and millions and millions of years. Exactly then it is quite natural that we're evolved to want to be moral and to want to be good to other people. Now, we are also evolved to be partly selfish. There's evolutionary pressures in both directions. But a lot of people think that, you know, if you don't believe in God, you won't want to be nice to other people. But the caller very clearly was making it clear that he wants to, be, he wants to believe in God because he wants to be nice. And I think Jeff's point was that, well, hey, you already want to be nice, what's your point? Yeah. Right? Why throw in the supernatural? Yes. Right, and there's a metaphor for this that I think might help people understand it. If you put your hand on a stove, and it hurts, and you pull your hand away, you don't have to want to pull your hand away. You don't have to want for it to hurt when you put your hand on a stove. You're just evolved to be that way. And similarly, okay. when atheists see people suffering... It hurts to see people suffering. It's painful, because yes. we're evolved to be social and sympathetic and empathetic organisms. And so there really is no conflict, and you don't really need this idealism that, oh, I want something that makes me want to be good. Then this is something that I think very few Christians really understand, is how much when people like us evaluate what we believe and discard a lot of beliefs, we don't discard the wanting to be nice to other people, wanting the world to be a better place, wanting society to function well, and having great concern for issues like, if we all violate all the laws, will society fall apart? That, in fact, people will care. Right. I, I appreciate your input. Sure. You have a great week. You too. Bye. Let's go on down to Aaron. Yeah, um, outside of whether, you know, the belief in God, whether God is real or God is not, whether he exists, what about the societal utility of religion? I mean, what about the other things that religion does uh, for our society as far as the belief in something greater, the belief in tr striving to be something better? Uh, don't you think that has some kind of utility for society outside well, of whether God is real or not real? Mark, would would you include the utility in holding down the population through war? Well, no, but, I mean, religion is not solely responsible for that. I mean, you know, right. uh, there's there's all kinds of organizations, governmental, uh, otherwise, that have nothing to do or have very little to do with religion that have started wars in the same way that there are a lot of good things that have been done by religion uh, in times of war, giving people hope, uh, nurturing people, uh, uh, you know, trying to help people think that there's something better so that they can endure this horrible suffering, as, for example, during the Holocaust. Right. I mean, how 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 can you completely discount that? Oh, hi, Aaron. I hey, recognize your voice. Jeffy, baby. How you doing? <laughs> uh, I would respond the you know by referring back to the previous caller who says, well, if people want to be better and want things to be better, then that's already. I mean, that if that's what they want and that's what draws them to religion, well, they already want that. So the religion is just, you know. That seems to me a superfluous holding tank for those attitudes that they've already got. You know, well, well, no, they, I mean, they don't need a justification to want the world to be a better place, or to want to to improve, or to want to look to, up to some ideal. 
you know, it's, but to, to say that, well, we all want to make it the same ideal and then have this organization and funnel a lot of money through that and get people to believe a lot of superstitious nonsense, you know, in, in take advantage of people's desire to believe in something greater, to have this completely superfluous organization seems to me a big waste of time and effort. Well, but it sounds like what you're uh, uh, saying that what's bad is not so much religion in general, but it's outdated religion. I mean, if a religion came along that embraced a lot of uh, scientific principles that 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 uh, uh, wanted to 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 uh, better society, but not by jumping back into the dark ages, but by going forward with the advancement of technology, with uh, uh, the use of the scientific method. But they also believed in something greater, some greater. Spirit, entity, yeah, well, whatever. Uh, they, uh, see, I, when I there, we had the earlier caller who was talking about, um, you know, the uh, w- uh, in, th- that belief in God made it easier for him to stick to uh, on to stick to efforts to achieve unattainable goals, right? Right. And well, that's one of those greater things, right? An unattainable goal is one of those greater things. There's no need for an irrational basis for that. That reason does not tell you that. If there's some goal you can never, uh, you know, perfectly attain, that you shouldn't set out in that way, that direction in the first place. Reason says no such thing. Any improvement in a, a desirable direction is is better, All right? And uh, and again, you know, taking taking these unattainable goals and personifying them as some kind of supernatural entity is the problem. Um, there are groups that have tried to do what you're what you're talking about. There's the North Texas Church of Free Thought, which is an atheist church. Right? And right, they do all the church stuff. They have the social gatherings. They have sermons that are basically, you know, a, a, the, the 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 pastor exhorting people to be rational. Um, and that's interesting, a, a very interesting experiment. And I'm I'm watching to see how that goes. Right. Uh, there are other people who 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 view humanism as a religion, and so on and so forth. And you know, in in those cases, yeah, maybe maybe that's workable. My my one concern about things like that is that when you make when you take sensible goals and you put an emotional spin on them, there's always a danger of of going off on some tangent away from the original rational objectives, you know, because you're drawn in a different direction by the emotional appeal. Well, right, but, and but that's you what can't I think is wrong. With I mean, how, how can you place. separate the emotion from humanity? That is that is virtually impossible. You know, there's always going to be emotion, whether it be in art, in science, in whatever. There's going to sure. be no, great I'm not, and I'm not, uh, I'm not saying that this is that this is that therefore all reason-based religions will fail. I'm saying that is my concern about them, right? Well, and, I'm, but, but, and I'm interested in seeing how they do. Okay, but my question is, can those reason-based uh, religions not also have an element of strong emotion uh, because of a belief system or because... I mean, because people well, are Well, maybe they can. Over... These are early experiments. Okay. I mean, none of these things have, ex- have existed for very long. So, so is it, you know, is that's it, why I'm, I'm waiting to see what happens. Is it the icon? Is it, is it the, 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 the worshiping of an icon that you object to? Or is it more mm. that these people think that there is some intelligent supernatural entity no, out it's, there? It's, it's, it's much simpler. Like, okay, you get a group of people together, right? These happen to be, these happen to be Islamic people, right? Okay. They get together, they have their, 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 uh, their, uh, their icon, their goal, or whatever that they all believe in, right? Right. And, there's emotional, they have a leader who emotionally exhorts them to follow that, right? right. Part of that message is going to be, look at them other people over there not doing what we do, right? Right. And that leads to this group of people thinking they're, you know, there's something wrong with that other group of people and they're better than those people and, and that can get out of control. And the same thing can happen if you have rationalists getting together, like, like oh, we're getting together to exhort one another to be rational and to point figures at those people who aren't rational and talk about how we're better than them, exactly. and that can get out of control, and I'm exactly. worried about that. I think people should always be worried about that, not that we can ever completely get rid of those feelings, but we do have to keep a careful eye on them. Okay. Right? That's yeah. what I'm saying. Yeah, I appreciate your call. We have a bunch of other calls. All right. Thanks for calling, Aaron. Okay, you guys take care. You have a great week. Well, you too. Uh, so that, of mine. that line's gone, so we're going to Stephen. Stephen. Yeah. How you doing? I'm good. I, I just had a, you know, a brief, like, qu- first, my question is, is, uh, you know, give me, like, a brief definition on atheism. Is it, is it the belief of nothing? No, it's not, the belief, we have no beliefs on or about the supernatural. I mean, well, then I guess my only, what, I, what I'm wondering is, 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 I just don't understand the purpose of a congregation of atheists. Like, you see, you speak of an atheist church, you know, I mean, I'm all... Yeah. 
we're we're not an atheist church. There is an organization like that up near Dallas. Yeah, I know. That's what I'm right. saying, though. But I don't understand the concept of, of a, a group of atheists. If you don't believe in anything, I don't have understand you, the, the, have you, the point of congregation. Have you ever heard of the religious right? Uh, yeah, I've heard of okay. it. Okay. These are people who are, uh, who are uh, they're open about attempting to make the United States a Christian state, okay? Okay. Where it will be illegal for us to have our opinion about God, right? Yeah. And... At that at that point, as soon as there's anything like that happening in our society, we have a reason to band together, talk with one another, uh, and and you know organize and and try to be taken seriously. Yeah, but my point is, is, is like I said, atheism is basically a belief in no religion, right? It atheism is it, okay. There, <laughs> Ray gave one definition. The definition I would give is the lack of a belief in any gods. Okay, so right. that's what I'm saying. Then, then I mean, I don't understand the point of congregation if there's no belief in anything there. Well, well the, we, we get together and educate ourselves on the current events and issues and the political candidates that are out there because right now there's a strong political uh, movement to put the Ten Commandments back in the school. Uh, there was a strong political movement that put God we trust on our money back in the 50s and everything else. Yeah, again, we are not... We are not an atheist church, so we're, we're really the wrong people to ask about the justification for that, because that's not what we do, okay. right? We're a, we're a social group. Okay. Um, you could, the, the North Texas Church of Free Thought has a web page. You can email them and ask them this question if that's what you'd like to do. All right. We need right. to go. You have a great week. You too. You, Gerald. You, Gerald? Yes, hello. Good morning. Good morning. I'd like to know what, what the debate is about. We're uh, we're not having a debate. Uh, actually, it, uh, I was thinking about giving the floor over to Mark here uh, because we're almost out of time. Uh, Mark had uh, several things he'd like to discuss. Well, I've covered a couple of them. Um, let's see what I can pull up here. Um, uh, one thing that I can mention is the uh, the fact that uh, our Constitution contains uh, gives Congress the power to promote science and useful arts. And uh, so apparently the framers of the Constitution thought that there was uh, very, it was very sensible uh, to promote science and useful arts. Uh, and of course, uh, they, uh, they, well, maybe. Okay, caller, do you have a question? Yeah, I wanted to know if you had any religious beliefs. No, you know, we're, we're atheists, sir. We're, yeah, that, that's a no. Atheists. Yes. Yeah. We, we do not believe in any gods. That's our thing. Anything else? Okay, uh, can I ask you this question? Sure. Who do you think created mankind? And who created the stars, the moon, and all this? Is? How nope. did all this come about? No who, one created it, it through the national natural process of the laws of physics and Mark here is a former physics teacher uh, that it's they they came about naturally they were not created naturally yeah. yes uh, I, you would you would say that that they were that those things were created everything. by God caller yeah would you say that those things were created by God they have to be well then who created God so that's the problem with that with that line of reasoning, is it doesn't really answer the question. It just puts off the answer one more step. And, see, but he yeah. has no creative. He yeah, well, you could, if, you, if it's fair to say that about God, it's fair to say that about the universe. Is it, um, um, because think about this. If, if there wasn't no God, yeah. you wouldn't be sitting in that chair right now. Uh, we, no. we, there we is no God. I agree we're with that basic chair. premise. Uh, what I'd like to point out, too... Just uh, like y'all, if y'all had kids... Yeah. Y'all create the kids. Uh, so, does that mean we're gods? Not, not in anything like you're the same gods, sense that your God is God's supposed to have created the universe. That's what I'm huh? Uh, God's children. Uh, That's what I'm saying. Okay, but uh, my point is that uh, the reason you, I think the reason you believe that the way you do is uh, it's your own vanity that wants you to think that the human being, that this whole massive universe was somehow created just for human beings on this little rock going around this insignificant star and this whole billions of stars that are out there. Uh, it's your own vanity that tried to elevate yourself 
to a, a special place, and human beings aren't in that special place. But we was put here for a purpose. And that's what purpose what was that? You to tell become, me. Become saints. To become things? To become saints. saints. To become saints. Yes. Yeah. Well, uh, to keep working on it. the sacrifice <laughs> that Jesus died on the cross for us. Yeah. So, you can't even prove Jesus was a real our, person. Our sins. You can't even prove Jesus as a real person. There, there, the, the historical facts on the person of Jesus are so sketchy and few that uh, in, any, anybody with any sense at all would not look, be able to look at that and say that that person did not exist. So it, uh, your, your whole premise is uh, flawed from the very beginning. I have a bunch of other callers, though. I got to go. Right. You have a great week. Uh, Alex. Alex? Oh. Alex? Hey, uh, yeah. Good morning. Um, I think y'all probably a bunch of demonic worshipers or something if you don't believe in God. No, we don't believe in demons either, sir. No, uh, if we don't believe in God, we don't believe in the devil. Well, I think we're probably, we're the, probably uh, the supreme animals on the planet or something because if you don't believe in God, who created all this? We uh, just went through that question. We have another yeah. caller's go. You, you take care. Uh, <laughs> let's go on down to Derek. We're, out of, we're running out of time here. We've got two and a half minutes. Derek? Lost him. No, oh, I didn't. I'm sorry. Derek? All right. You got time for another call? Two and a half minutes, quickly. Yeah. How do you resolve the, uh, the question between atheism and agnosticism? Between saying, I know there's no God, between saying, I just don't know if there's a God, a rational person. I, take this uh, I love this Jeff, question. Jeff wants okay. to answer this. And uh, I'm going to hang up because we're running out of time. Atheism is a statement about what you believe. And agnosticism is a statement about what you think you can know. And by those definitions, there are, there are agnostic atheists who don't believe but say that it's really not possible to know. And given that, they have decided not to believe. You can also have agnostic theists who believe in God even though they admit it's impossible to really know. Um, so that, that's how we make that distinction. Uh, I guess we'll try one more quickly here. Tom? Yeah. And the last caller, quickly. Yeah, um, I was trying to take an issue with the statement y'all made earlier about there's no proof that Jesus ever existed. Yeah. Actually, there's a lot of historical proof um, like through Jews and actually Roman historians that Jesus existed as a person. Yeah, read any books on that subject other than the ones that, uh, that are written by Christians trying to prove something, okay? Read books about that written by other people who have looked at it in more dispassionately. And what you'll find is that the, the, the sources that are cited as evidence are really e extraordinarily unreliable. Well, Josephus, for example. Josephus is, uh, is known, a, is a known by historian. biblical scholars to have, that passage is known to be a for forgery. The passage about Jesus. Uh, well, let's first refer to that. It, it, there yeah, are yeah. scholars, there are earlier scholars that quoted Josephus never mentioning that passage. Later in history, you, we have a, a church leader who's on record saying it's okay to lie to convince people that, that Jesus existed. And, uh, and, af and that's the first guy who mentioned that passage in Josephus. Okay? Yeah. So, uh, come on. Uh, we're out of time. Uh, please take your history and call back. All right. You have a great Thanks week. Thanks for calling. Uh, we'd like to remind everyone uh, we're heading down to the Hot Jumble Bakery once we leave here. It was down West 5th and Lavaca. Uh, we had a great time, Mark. I'm sorry you didn't get to talk much. I appreciate you coming. You brought, oh, uh, he brought this. You're down to 10 seconds. Brought, 10 seconds. Brought some science toys that you can uh, show your kids come at down the, the bagel Hot Jumble Bakery. Yes. Uh, come on down. We love you, Austin. <laughs>